<clears throat> Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this morning's event presented by the Social Science Department of Tarrant County College Connect Campus. I am Dr. Brian Zarantas, and I am currently Assistant Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences here at Connect. Uh, today's talk on the airlines after 9-11 is the uh, fourth in a series covering 9-11 in history, memory, and legacy. And I want to extend special thanks to uh, Misty Mertens, Social Science Chair here at Connect for uh, organizing this whole series. Now, before introducing our guest speaker uh, for today, I uh, first want to provide some, some background to the events of that uh, morning uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it, it's odd, I think, that I feel some, some level of nervousness talking about this uh, not because of any fear of public speaking or anything like that, but because uh, I'm used to, as a historian, speaking about the tragedies and horrors of the relatively distant past and not so much about those of our recent past. You know, Spanish flu outbreak of 1918, 1919, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, or the Galveston hurricane of 1900, you know, those were terrible events, um, but you know, I wasn't a witness, and so I tend to look at those from the somewhat objective perspective of an academic. But what we're remembering today, however, is a completely different story uh, for me. Uh, it's one that I was able to listen to on my uh, car radio, transfixed by the shocked and panicked voices coming through the, the speakers. I then watched with horror from a barber's chair as I was getting a haircut and then later on in my, in my living room. Um, so, you know, very different kind of perspective. Uh, at the time, of course, I knew I was witnessing, you know, obviously from a distance uh, here in Fort Worth, uh, but witnessing nonetheless a, a turning point in our, our nation's history. Uh, and that, that morning uh, began for the American people like a, a, a typical September morning but proceeded to unravel as the morning progressed. Uh, 19 men, trained agents of the Al-Qaeda terror organization, hijacked four planes armed only with box cutters and knives. American Airlines Flight 11 flying from Boston to New York, Flight 77 from Washington Dulles to LAX, United Flight 175 from Boston to LAX, and Flight United Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco. Unlike previous hijackings, such as in the 1970s when hijackings were much more common, uh, these Al-Qaeda hijackers had no demands and took no hostages. Uh, instead, they intended on flying their planes into symbols of American political, economic, and military might. Uh, the two towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, the Pentagon, headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense, and the U.S. Capitol Building. Uh, what was Al-Qaeda? Uh, at, at its basic level, it was a terrorist organization created uh, by uh, Osama bin Laden, a Saudi national who was dedicated to fighting the U.S. Uh, he believed in his word that the, in the, he believed in his words that uh, the U.S. Uh, wanted to occupy our countries, steal our resources, and impose on us agents to rule us. That was how he saw it. Now, this was not the first time that bin Laden and al-Qaeda had targeted the U.S., nor was it the first terror attack on the World Trade Center. Uh, in 1998, just a few years prior, uh, al-Qaeda set off truck bombs outside the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, killing 224 people. And then several years prior to that, in 1993, four terrorists detonated a truck bomb underneath Tower One of the World Trade Center, killing six people and injuring over a thousand. This attack, however, was much, much worse. Uh, on that uh, September 11th morning at 8.46 Eastern Time, American Airlines Flight 11 was flown into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And as horrifying as that was, the enormity of the situation and the reality that this was not a tragic accident, but instead a deliberate attack did not dawn on many people until the second plane, United Flight 175, struck the second tower just 17 minutes later. Uh, both uh, towers of the World Trade Center were now on fire with gaping holes in their sides from where the airliners had crashed into them. Uh, New York firefighters and police officers were 
busy uh, devoting themselves to search and rescue and of course putting their lives on the line. Uh, by 9.30 a.m. that morning, uh, President George W. Bush, who was visiting an elementary school in Sarasota, Florida, uh, announced that the nation had suffered from an apparent terrorist attack. And then seven minutes after that, UN flight, uh, U, uh, United Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. Then at 9.40 a.m., with three major American landmarks burning, uh, the FAA ordered uh, all planes in the U.S. to be grounded, which was the first time such an order had been given. And then unknown to most Americans watching and listening to everything unfold, a fourth plane, United Flight 93, had been hijacked and still had yet to reach its intended destination, which was the U.S. Capitol building. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, things were still unfolding at the World Trade Center as uh, millions of Americans were now uh, glued to their TVs. Uh, the, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed at 1010 that morning. And uh, onlookers there on the southern tip of Manhattan uh, were rushing in panic as uh, smoke and dust just filled the air. And then four minutes later, near the small Pennsylvania town of uh, Shanksville, Al-Qaeda terrorists on board United Flight 93 uh, crashed the plane into a field as passengers and crew tried to retake control of the plane. And then finally, 102 long and painful minutes after the attacks had begun, uh, the North Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed at 10.28 a.m. Uh, by the time it was all over, uh, 2,977 people had died, including all passengers and crew on board the four airplanes, 184 people inside the Pentagon, and about 343 firefighters and police officers heroically conducting search and rescue missions in the burning towers of the World Trade Center. The impact of that morning, of course, reverberated around the globe. Uh, the U.S. economy suffered uh, an estimated $123 billion in uh, losses over the next uh, two to four weeks, uh, while the cost of the damage to the World Trade Center site and nearby buildings and subway facilities was estimated to be around $60 billion. Now, one part of the economy that especially suffered uh, as a result of 9-11 was the airline industry. Uh, to speak about the effect of the 9-11 attacks on the airline industry, we have uh, Mr. Keith Smelser, currently an instructor of computer science here at TCC. Uh, Mr. Smel Smelser has worked in the uh, tech industry uh, for 29 years, including 20 years with Southwest Airlines from 1996 to 2016. Mr. Smelser joined TCC as a computer and in science instructor in 2017. So, uh, Mr. Smelser, uh, thank you for this, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bryan. I hope everyone can hear me and see me okay. So, I, I do want to thank the Social Science Department for allowing me to speak here uh, today. You know, this is a topic that needs to be needs to be known. And I'm realizing that, you know, we have a generation now that has uh, lived past this and uh, it's good to know these things uh, because this is real. You know, for many people, um, especially my generation, there's the time pre 9-11 and the time post 9-11. It was obviously a very, very tragic day. Um, it, um, I mean, for me, just personally, I had actually visited uh, the towers uh, one time. Um, I had been in New York any time at that time. If you visited Manhattan, that was one of the things to do. You would see the Statue of Liberty and you'd go to the top of the World Trade Center, uh, as well as many other things that are there. Uh, my brother had actually spent the weekend in New York and was had stayed at the Marriott that was in one of the towers over that previous weekend, and he had checked out that Monday. I also had a friend of mine that was flying during 9-11. He was on an aircraft and it landed. Uh, he got to his destination, but you could tell things were really odd, uh, but he had actually left New York earlier that day. So I, I would say a lot of people have stories. Um, some worse than others, but almost everyone 
would remember, I would say everyone remembers where they were that day. For me, I just kind of want to share kind of in a conversational tone, if that's okay, just kind of what my day was like and what there was what it was like there. Uh, it started as a normal day. Um, and uh, I was, I recall listening, I, I drove to work listening to the radio and there was no broadcast in, on my station. I didn't hear anything unusual. It wasn't until I got to work that obviously there were things that were wrong. And uh, at Southwest, they had uh, some big screens uh, in the hallways that would typically show uh, uh, commercials and things that were industry related. And at this time, it was showing the news and which was not typical and when i got there both towers had been hit and a friend of mine told me it looked like we were under attack and one thing to to really you need to appreciate you need to understand at that time is no one knew what was going to happen no one knew what the next step was no one knew what the next event was going to be there was absolutely no um, insight. I mean, even the towers falling, that was not known that that would happen um, or how many aircraft was involved or why they were doing any of this. It, um, it was very, uh, you know, all, the, all these unknowns were happening. Obviously at Southwest, I, I was working at the, uh, what was called the Tigla system at the time and uh, we were getting a large amount of cancellations all at once and so we we knew uh, you know people were panicked and uh, it was quite scary a actually at one point with southwest uh, this is not well known but the faa had required uh, all the aircraft to land that day and immediately and uh, it turned out one of our aircraft was not uh, located. It seemed to be missing. But if what had happened was it was forced to land at an airport that had no Southwest presence. Uh, and they just, the tower was so busy, no one knew what to do. And so fortunately that was, uh, you know, that was resolved. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of things like that were, were happening. Um, we immediately went on a 24 hour coverage in our department uh, that had not we had occasionally did that for major software releases or whatever but uh, we decided you know we had to do this because we had no idea what would happen and so we did that for i want to say at least three weeks of just having someone on site 24 hours just to be aware of, of what could happen. Um, so there were three days with uh, no flights. And so some people obviously were stranded, um, but that's just how, how it was at the time. Um, it took the industry about three years to recover. And the airline industry was not doing so well to begin with. Southwest was doing OK and doing rather well, actually, but other airlines were not. Um, there were some smaller airlines that immediately um, filed for bankruptcy. Uh, other airlines that weren't doing so well either um, would tend to blame 9-11 for some of their problems, but they had internal problems prior to that as well. Um, but a lot of major airlines, uh, American Airlines declared bankruptcy, United Air Airlines declared bankruptcy, U.S. Airways declared bankruptcy, and some of those bankruptcies went two to three years in bankruptcy. Um, it was a very challenging time, and it changed a lot of attitudes about flying, obviously. Before then, it was rather it was considered somewhat fun and even prior to that even though we had security and things people would you know complain but still it was kind of fun to do you could just go and be somewhere very quick 
um, all that all that attitude changed. And um, you know, just the seriousness of the impact and what was done was something that really was a cloud over the industry uh, for a very long time. You know, I know we often talk about attitudes changing and we think that, oh yeah, we, and like I just said, it's about the, um, uh, about the attitude towards flying. Uh, one of the things that was happening at Southwest was, well, this wasn't a major event, but what had happened the previous year was uh, uh, there was a flight, I believe it was to Seattle, where someone boarded the plane and uh, they had taken some drugs or whatever, and they the plane took off. They, this person got out of control and they stormed the uh, uh, the door of the where the pilots were, and unfortunately, um, this person had to be subdued and passengers got involved. And what happened later was uh, actually after they after they landed, they had subdued this person. This person died. Well, they ended up suing Southwest, saying that things had been negligent as a result or whatever. Um, but that court case was actually scheduled for September 15th and uh, of that year of 2021, excuse me, <laughs> 2001, excuse me. Um, so that case was just quietly dropped after 9-11. After I mean, people realized it just changed attitudes, uh, I, I would say. Um, one of the things that we had to do, uh, there were different agencies that were created at this time. The uh, TSA, um, excuse me, the Transport Security Administration was created. Uh, and then about a year later, the Homeland Security was created. Now, Homeland Security, even today, I, as I understand it, they're involved with even COVID-19. Uh, if you go to their website, they have COVID-19 things that they're involved in. So they're a rather broad group. But the, uh, but the Transport uh, Security Administration was primarily geared towards uh, you know, all the things that were required to confirm the things were safe, you know, for you to fly. And that incurred, that was all sort of inspections of luggage and uh, the things that happened. Uh, there was actually later, this, some people may remember this, but there was actually something called a shoe bomber. This person tried to go and they had some uh, things in their shoe. Well, of course, they were, <laughs> That, that you know that was a big deal. So that's why you typically end up taking your shoes off uh, going through security. Um, many many things like that that um, were were going on that were kind of new and discovered uh, to to do. There is a um, let's see. There's an ID name check as well that was implemented so that certain people you know with certain names were not allowed to fly. Well, it just so happened that you can't simply just go by a name because people have, not every name is unique in the world. So that system was implemented, but then it was realized, oh, we need to have some sort of way around that. And so that was, that seemed, everyone knew that was kind of a crazy way to do it, but it was implemented and, and they did it that way. Um, so there were a lot of things that were done just to try to make things more secure, might try to make things more safe. And in a lot of ways, I do believe uh, that it, you know, the end result is a more secure, a more safe way to fly. And that any type of um, thing that was planned like before is going to be rather difficult to to do now um i mean and, and our airline industry is an important industry in the u.s um, it's one of the things that helps generate growth in any um in any uh, area uh, 
cities that have airports are going to be larger than ones that don't. And cities that get especially uh, traffic from new airlines, they notice a growth in revenue. So um, now in today's world, there's different challenges, obviously, with COVID and, and such. But going back to just 9-11, um, it was it was definitely a, a time that uh, should be well understood and well remembered because of many, many people lost their lives that day. And it's really unfortunate just the, um, you know, just the tragedy that was that was part of that. So I just wanted to share some some comments about and just some of my experience about being at an airline, you know, when that happened. Um, you know, a couple of things. Just working. If one of the things we talk about a lot of in computer science is learning skills. Well, in any uh, work environment, you also want to learn your business as well. And so it really helped that I had been there a while and I knew some of the things that were done internally. Um, I'm not trying to shoot my horn or anything, but I'm just saying that um, knowing how to program and how to develop systems is one thing, but you also need to always be able to support your business and whatever it, whatever it needs. And you know, it's, uh, it's a real working crazy hours sometimes happens because it is a true tragedy. And so um, it was we came together as a team to get through that. And so it, it was really, um, you know, I, I still have a lot of friends from that time because we went through those, you know, those experiences together. So I really don't have much more to share. I'm I'm open to answering any questions, but I just wanted to kind of just share what it was like at that day and you know some of the things that happened as a result. Uh, yeah, I, I do have uh, one question. This is um, Dr. Swanthus again. Sure. Um, about how long did it take uh, Southwest Airlines in, in particular to really uh, recover as far as the typical flow of, of passenger traffic? Well, the overall industry was roughly three years. Um, Southwest, I think, was a little bit ahead of that. Um, but yeah, that uh, it took it took some time. We were in a constant growth uh, rate at that time because we were adding new planes and new cities, and we were still uh, Southwest was much smaller than it was then. I do recall that October um, and one year I, it wasn't a one, but I think it's two thousand. October had more traffic than July. And you would think, oh, the summer would be the peak time, but they were growing so much um, that you know it was just constantly increasing. So Southwest managed fairly well, but I will say this: Southwest um, manages their uh, assets very differently than other, and have they have different expectations in terms of of uh, being able to ride through the rough times. So um, it was roughly, it's was, it was probably a little over two years for Southwest to get back to normal in terms of, uh, in terms of traffic and, and, uh, and income. Great, thank you. There are certain industries, just to kind of mention that, there are certain industries that uh, might lose money during a quarter and that's expected um, and you know if you make it up later in the year you're okay uh, not every industry works that way we do have one question from uh, lisa brown uh, she she remembers that for years after 9 11 uh, a lot of people wouldn't fly on that day right 
And so she was wondering, is that still the case where a lot of you see traffic um, maybe not as heavy on 9-11? Yeah. On yes. Now, I would say probably early on, especially the year anniversary, two-year and the five-year, uh, people avoided that. Um, but and, and maybe even this, you know, the 10th or 20th. But yeah, that is an ongoing concern. Um, that that's a valid question too, because people, you know, people remember, and so uh, that's that's true. There is a um, not not a, people pause sometimes about flying on on 9/11. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from uh, Hannah K. Brazil. And she's asking, uh, how long did it take for uh, them to come up with a good security system? Wow, that's a great question. Um, the TSA was the first organization. Um, it, there's a lot to security. Obviously, knowing that that people aren't dangerous uh, to begin with is, is one, and that's really where the homeland security uh, came in because it was realized later that if I want to say if the FBI and CIA were actually communicating better, they would have foreseen this. Um, the as as you had mentioned, Brian, Dr. Brian, that uh, there were 19 hijackers. Well, there were so there was three planes with five, one with four. So why did one plane have four and not five? And uh, they did some research and found someone that really should have been the fifth hijacker, but he had some passport issues or, or something. Some of these people were taking flight lessons here in the US and they had been reported because they weren't concerned about, uh, they had some very odd attitudes and weren't concerned about learning how to land, things like that, uh, that were very concerning to the people that were instructing them. Uh, so there was a lot of information that could have been done, there, a lot of things that could have been tied together. And so a lot of the information uh, gathering and monitoring that as a result of, uh, of that is, you know, started with 9-11. With Thank you. And uh, kind of a follow up, she's asked a follow up question on that as far as uh, metal detectors before 9 11. Uh, were metal detectors all that common at the airports? Uh, I do believe they were. I do recall that. I, I remember flying somewhere and I actually left my wallet uh, after I stepped, you know, I said probably way a few feet or so and, and went back. And so I do recall that, uh, but that was the case. One thing I will tell you about the, you may not realize this, but if you ever watch a movie and someone goes up to the gate to say goodbye or they're at the gate to welcome them or whatever, that's definitely pre 9-11 because after 9-11, you're not allowed inside the the gate area of any airport. As you know now, you, you say goodbye as they go through security. But prior to that, you could, and I did this a lot of times, my wife would fly in from somewhere and I'd go meet her at the gate and she'd get off the plane and we'd, we'd go from there. So I do see movies occasionally that have those scenes and I know that's 9-11, that's, that's pre-9-11. Uh, Professor Downs mentions that uh, metal detectors began in the 1970s in the uh, in the airports. You know, I wonder there, if that was connected to the the rash of uh, hijackings that do you really start to see take off globally uh, in the 70s? Well, you know, one of the things that came up uh, that's a good point. Uh, the DB Cooper uh, hijacking. If if I'll just give a short 
explanation of that. This was a person that hijacked an aircraft and he demanded a ransom. The plane landed, he was given the ransom, and then he parachuted out of the back of this uh, aircraft um, over, I believe it was either Oregon or Seattle, uh, but in a highly wooded area, you know, hundreds of miles of wooded area. They, he's never been found. And I believe the money's been located or partial part of the money's been found, but um, he was never found. And at that time, you you bought a plane ticket like uh, like a bus ticket. You paid for it and you got on the plane. You didn't need an ID. They didn't have to know your name or anything like that. You just got on the plane. After that, that's when they got serious about having a real manifest and having, uh, you know, knowing details about the passengers. So, you know, basically all these new things have added, been added to the uh, uh, airline industry over time. Yeah, Professor Downs adds, and you know, think about unattended minors who could not have family meet them at the gate. They have to locate them outside of secure areas, which is uh, normal today. So right. yeah, there's been a lot of changes um, pre and post 9-11 flying is a, really a, a radically different world in a lot of ways. You know, you mentioned unaccompanied minors. Uh, I would do that. I would send my kids uh, to grandma's or whatever. And yeah, I took them to the gate and they had a card around their neck and they they flew off. And so I know it's different now. Actually, it, if I could share a story at 9-11, there were unaccompanied minors flying. Uh, and when they were forced to land, they weren't anywhere near where they're supposed to be. And you have, you know, three days of no air travel. So these children were I, from this. I can tell you from the southwest side, they ended up staying with the flight attendants and they took care of them and took them to to parks and, and you know, uh, amusement parks or whatever they could do uh, you know, during that time. And I know they had some good friendships that were created as part of that, uh, because that's rather scary that, you know, you're your child or grandchild is on a flight and they're not, now they're stuck in Omaha and they're supposed to be in LA. Uh, but, you know, all that, a lot of people came together and, and worked all that out. So there weren't any ugly stories, I can tell you about that, that came out of that. All that was, all, all of that came out quite well. I think we have uh, another uh, comment and question from uh, Shaniqua Carter. She says that uh, for herself at this time, she was a middle schooler and had never experienced traveling by plane. Uh, for a long time, even into adulthood, she was very apprehensive because of the fear and trauma from that day. And that uh, though we, you know, she knows we can't foresee the future. Hopefully nothing like this ever happens again. So you know, her question is, would you say that our airport and airline security systems are sophisticated enough at this moment to prevent something like this from ever happening again? Well, I would say there definitely it's definitely a serious endeavor to do. And I the most recent tragedies have not involved security related issues. Um, it's been more of uh, say plane design with the 737 MAX um, or pilots partially being overworked, that type of thing. But those, uh, it's actually quite rare. Statistically, and I know this doesn't matter when it's you, but statistically air travel is, is much safer than most any other uh, travel, especially car. Um, and, you know, it's highly efficient. People travel every single day. One of the things that blew my mind was uh, before I worked at Southwest, I worked at uh, for Frito-Lay, and they had an office that just happened to be outside of Love Field. 
And I just watched constantly the planes land and take off every single day, all constantly. And so it, this is going on worldwide everywhere. So uh, it's very, very unusual. And there's been years of, of no accidents. Uh, it would be great to say a decade of no accidents, but that's not really happened yet. But, um, you know, I think in the 50, year of, uh, 50 years of Southwest, there's been only two. Um, one was maintenance related, one was pilot related, uh, and that's pretty, pretty rare. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, if you do travel a lot, you, you definitely take the safety for granted. Um, but I can't imagine security wise, uh, that being, that being an issue. I mean, as long as they're strictly looking for these things and being on top of it. Um, and I think really, especially in the U.S., I think we're very, very safe. Professor Downs mentions another um, thing that, that really changed as a result. Uh, talking about how airport businesses, you know, such as the restaurants and things like that that you see at the airport, uh, those were hurt significantly because guests didn't go in with passengers and eat or shop while waiting for a plane, right? And so, right, there, there's a whole lot of a lot of uh, customers lost when everything ends up having to go uh, behind security, right? You, you know, that, that reminds me too, prior to 9-11, and this was just prior, it, it was like 2000 or so, there was some discussion about making DFW a mall where basically you could go shop and if you travel, that's great. But the idea was to open up the shop so uh, they were more accessible, you know, and people would actually go there to shop. Uh, that, that there was some discussion about that, but obviously that's that's not going to happen. All right, so if we don't have any further questions, we can just go ahead and wrap this up. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Smelser, for uh, presenting uh, and uh, sharing some of your insights on the effect of 9-11 uh, on the airline industry and uh, and flying. Uh, Ms. Mertens has placed the uh, attendance link there in the chat, so be sure to uh, check that out. Also, I want to bring attention to uh, two more events that we have as part of this whole series uh, looking at 9-11 and history, memory, and legacy. Uh, tonight at 7 p.m. prime time slot, uh, we have uh, a talk on 9-11 and scientific advancements. Uh, we have uh, instructors uh, Natalie Rus Russell and uh, Amna Qureshi talking about that. And then uh, we have uh, two uh, history instructors uh, talking uh, tomorrow at uh, 1 o'clock on uh, discarded shoes, 9-11 uh, in uh, history and memory. So thank you all so much for being here and uh, listening to these insights. And uh, thank you, Mr. Smelser, for sharing uh, uh, your uh, memories of 9-11. And I just, uh, again, want to thank everybody for attending uh, this event. And if you've attended uh, prior events or plan on attending the future events, uh, thank you all so much for being a part of this. You all have a great afternoon. <laughs>